Welcome to the Axe Reading Series. In April 2020, Axe was supposed to host four New Brunswick poets here in the Axe Gallery as part of National Poetry Month. But of course, the pandemic hit, so we had to change direction. Instead, we invited the poets one at a time here to the Axe Gallery to offer readings and have conversations with Dr. Sue Sinclair, acting as moderator. Sue is a poet herself. She has written five collections of poetry and her most recent, Heaven's Thieves, won the Pat Lowther Award. Sue is also editor at Brick Books and the Fiddlehead Literary Magazine, and she teaches creative writing at UNB Fredericton. I hope you enjoy these readings and conversations, and I appreciate your patience as this technology is new to Axe, and we're figuring it out as we go. Thanks very much and enjoy. So I'm delighted to welcome you, Jennifer Hool, to the Axe uh, Arts and Culture Centre here in Sussex. Uh, thanks for coming out. And thanks for having me. I'm delighted to be here. And for those of you who don't know Jennifer, <laughs> uh, she's um, a New Brunswick native, grew up in Shediac. Um, she lives just outside of Fredericton now, uh, mother of two kids, um, and author of two books. Um, so The Back Channels was her first book of poetry. Uh, which won uh, the Alfred G. Bailey Poetry Prize uh, when it was manuscript, and then in book form won the Abrams Poetry Award, and was also shortlisted for the Gerald Lampert Award, which is for the best first book of poetry by a Canadian. So kudos to you on that. Um, she is also, um, oh, and Virga is the new book. Uh, so uh, Virga came out uh, last year, um, and it won this year's Fiddlehead Poetry Book Prize. So. Um, continuing to uh, attract readers. Um, and Jennifer is also a very precious community organizer of literary events. Um, been on the board for Fredericton's Word Feast, I think since it began, right? Yes, since it began. Yeah, so thank you for that work. <laughs> yes. Um, we wouldn't have moments like this if we didn't have the people organizing it, right? So I don't know if you want to start us off maybe by reading some poems and then we'll talk a little bit and see where it goes. That sounds good. Um, I thought I would actually, um, so Virga came out, in, like you mentioned, in 2019, and um, I was able to promote it a little bit when it first came out, but then along came winter and COVID hit, so I've really not been able to promote it the way that I wanted to, so I'm really grateful to be here today. And this book actually contains a series of five linked poems that I've never had the opportunity to read in sequence before, mm -hmm. so I thought today would be a good opportunity to do that. Um, so Virga has a lot of poems in it, uh, sort of along a theme of falling from stars, women who have fallen, uh, the lost Pleiade, falling to earth, and, and what that can sort of represent or, or symbolize in terms of just coming into awareness and, and growing up, like it can be like falling into a foreign world. And as I was working on these poems, it just coincided with a time when my little boys and I were watching Wizard of Oz every single day. Uh, as children do. Over. You're going to read the Dorothy poems. I'm going to read the Dorothy oh, poems. Awesome. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so I started to think a lot about Dorothy, and I was like, I'm working on these poems about falling from stars. And she, she well, in the book, she doesn't. It, they don't say fall from a star, but in the movie they do. She fell from a star. So I thought I should, I should explore that a little bit. So I looked at that idea of, uh, okay, well, it really, in, you know, in the movie, it's, it's made clear at the end that it was all a dream. Mm -hmm. And so my children and I were talking a lot about what, what that meant. Was it really a dream? What are dreams? And so my poet brain started to, to uh, revolve around that. And uh, I came up with these poems. I thought, well, what, what does it mean to have had a really, really life-changing, significant dream mm -hmm. and then to wake up and just be okay, what do I do, you know, how do I go on with my life on the farm now? Is everything the same, or is it is different? Everything the same, or is it different? <laughs> yeah. So that's where these poems come from, and uh, I'm really excited I get to read all five of them today. Mm -hmm. So the first one, Dorothy. I clang inside myself of late, 
Siren, conflagration, pitch and twitch as I unstitch my memory, a golden bolt of trek. My great beaten path, it nags, the witch I killed, the witches, merely vexing parts of me, knocked off for convenience, need to slug the wicked ones who got up in my face, maybe just road fever. I could feel her peering through that eye, sick with grief and envy, how this made her mean. I felt her sister's death, a sunrise in myself, proof of my deservingness. I wouldn't be alone, a friendless stranger. I merited help, my journey all that mattered. Now I see the truth of it, that others needed hope, but cannot change the dream that got me home. Until I came, they lingered without wisdom, heart, or nerve, uncertain of their powers. I made sure. So, part two. I am neither murderer nor muse. No one follows me. I have to count my chickens ere they hatch. The dog and I run down colorless roads. Straw men and contraptions hear my songs. I sing aloud in fields, kicking at the posts that mark the borders of our farm as counterpoint to nothing I can tell them. I check in on the hens, toss apples to the pigs. I made that teeming realm, and now it ails inside me unresolved. Whatever ails in it, ails in me too. They say that I am wan. I'm the one whose head was hit, and now I know a world in trauma born they don't. I see that world in them, see the quests our farmhands could be on and might be on internally. We do not talk of dreams here, though I know mine to be true. They know me to have dreamed and laugh me off, a face cloth to my brow, a kiss, dismissal. All is well, and they've no time to dither. And so, Dorothy part three. The hens give eggs, not emeralds. I sing about the sky. I can't sing of myself or what I know of aftermath, of doubling back to find the way and have it gone. Claptrap is the word I heard her use. Oh my. I could not reimagine my dear aunt. I needed her at home, or there'd have been no home to strive for. It may be she feels that and blames me. I blame myself. I let her have a voice to call my name when I was lost, and now she will not hear me. There's nothing in that world she could have been but end. The star I fell from and returned to, head split open, wanting things to change, wanting brighter colors, walkways made of brick from barn to barn, a lion made of stone to flank the gate, a journey to the fair at harvest time, sojourns in the city, good new shoes. For weeks, I made suggestions and she balked. Suddenly, I wanted curly cues. I know, I know. Our house had fallen down. I'd fallen too, and with my fall, their fears rose up like smoke that fills the room, impairing vision. Still, I wish they'd see the world in color. Couldn't hurt to paint the house in blue or red, and when it fades, we'll brighten it again, again, again. This could be my work, to bring the hues of hope and bravery to life. My work, to pull them from my mind into this blight, this gray we've all agreed to let go on and on, unchanging, dull, and grim. Now I dissent. Okay, is Dorothy a poet? Like, is this what's happening to her at the end here? Me? All this, like, I can't see like before, all's doubled, all means twice. And I was just like talking about imagery with my students and we were talking about choose blues. It's like, it's like uh, seeing twice or it's like being alive twice. Um, maybe, she, maybe she's, she's a dreamer before. Yeah, yeah. So maybe that's the first step on the road to, you know, growing up and becoming a poet or an artist. Mm -hmm. um, I love this conceit. I love thinking about like, what happens to Dorothy after? <laughs> and she seems such a sad figure. Like there's all kinds of invitations in these poems to her, like not to, 
I don't know, pursue whatever this new double vision is, right? Like the, the, the former Auntie M who's like not listening to her. And then like, you know, there's not a lot of money on the farm. So how does she continue to be a dreamer? Like, I, I don't know, I'm worried for her. <laughs> right, right. Well, I, that's, that's where my mind went when I started working on the poems. And okay, so uh, when I was a little girl, I was obsessed with The Wizard of Oz. And I always wanted to go on a journey like that. Like, I was always like, how could I get picked up? How could I get picked up by a tornado? Or, <laughs> you know, how can this happen to me? Like, I really wanted to. And we don't get them right here. <laughs> 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 and, and looking for rabbit holes too to see if I get to Wonderland. But, um, but so this idea, and I think I was a dreamer, kind of as a kid, right? Like when I, I, I had a big imagination, and I was right. So I thought, like, well, what would happen? I mean, I mean, growing up where I didn't study, I there weren't that many ways out either, and mm -hmm. and so I could relate to that that idea of having this, like, and I had read, like, a lot of books by the time I was eight, so I had this internal imaginary world that a lot of my friends maybe couldn't share or didn't share, my family certainly didn't share, and so I kind of knew what that solitude would be, mm -hmm. like, well, what would it be like to just have woken such a vibrant dream and you make friends and you saw all the people that you live with every day transfigure into other, other people, mm -hmm. and that actually does happen to us in our dreams all the time, mm -hmm. right, so I, so I thought about that, like, a life-changing dream and injury, because really, she got lost on the... Uh, and then, the yes, the trauma comes yeah. up there, right? Yeah, the trauma associated with dreaming, or that, uh, I don't know, they seem to end up together a little bit in these poems, the, the trauma and the dreaming. Well, I think so, because I, I, I think when you experience a trauma, too, it changes the way you see the world afterwards, right? And then maybe mm -hmm. you become a little bit more of an activist, which I feel mm -hmm. like she's kind of doing, too. She's like, okay, well, I had this thing happen to me, and now I see the world in yeah. Yes, because I do feel worried about her because I'm feeling like, you know, when you dream, in some ways, the sky's the limit. But she's back on the farm now, and I'm seeing all these pressures on her. But she also seems very determined. Right. Yeah? It's like, we're, I'm going to have to find the line now, um, which means I have to find the page. <laughs> uh, there's a line in which she's very determined. <laughs> I made sure, the end of that first one, right? Until I came, they lingered without wisdom, heart, or nerve, uncertain of their powers. I made sure. She's got, like, there's a determination in her, too, and, like, yeah. a, a sense of agency. I think so. I think when you first uh, develop new ideals, especially when you're young, you have this sense of urgency where you want to impart them to everybody else, too, right? Like, or, or if you... And he ends getting them whether she wants them or not. <laughs> right? right? And that can be a fine, a fine line to walk, especially when you come from a small town or a very traditional background, mm -hmm. right? Like, oh, I've been exposed to these new ideas and everybody's going to love them. No. Yeah, it's funny, we were just, uh, Alan uh, was just here reading his poem about his mother, and he was saying of her that she had ideas. <laughs> you know, she was a woman who had ideas, working class woman, but she had ideas. She had ideas. Like Dorothy, right? <laughs> I see ways we can improve things, right? Like I picture her, maybe she grows up and gets involved in like the global farm, uh, farmer union or politics or finds ways to, uh, you know, change her small community. Mm -hmm. You never know, right? Like to become a bit of an activist or to really want to get to public education somehow. Right. Yeah. And in a way she's saying, I am already wise, right? Like mm -hmm. I, mm -hmm. I just need the official training and then away we go. And she needs to just be able to keep building on what she's already started to become. Right. Yeah. Um, do you want to maybe read us something else? Did you have something else in mind? Well, sure. Or I, have, I have all kinds of things here. I've lost track of time, so I don't know. <laughs> I think we've been so, it's been a bit, uh, stopped and started. Well, you had mentioned to me, because I had told you, <laughs> that um, one of the things that I'm really interested in asking poets about is the relationship to beauty. Yes. And um, this is because I think it used to be assumed that as artists we pursue beauty. That is what we do. Um, and that's far less assumed now. Um, and uh, I'm just curious about whether beauty still has a role in uh, your poetic life. Uh, whether it's a concept that you have uh, any kind of a difficult relationship with, um, if there's any way in which you want to speak to your relationship with beauty or the concept of beauty. 
Okay, yes. Um, well, so I mean, I'm a poet who I think one of the first poems I ever really fell in love with and tried to, you know, suss out what it really meant was John Keats. Uh, we're going to reach an early beauty is truth and truth is beauty. So I've been mulling over that one for 20 some dang years. Right. <laughs> beauty is always true. Well, yeah. Beauty, right? Like, beauty yeah. can be um, very deceptive or it can be used to hide. Uh, it's like the food full of sugar that you put the medicine or the poison in, right? Sure. So, um, it can be a complicated thing. Beauty. Um, and um, I thought I would read this piece um, from my first book, Back Channels. Uh, it's one of those pieces that I've never really, I don't think I've ever read it. it it's just kind of one that, that I don't think about that much, but it actually uh, has a lot to say about beauty. I was reading a book when I wrote this. I think it was called Survival of the Prettiest, and I don't remember the name of the author, but oh, it was yeah. an argument that... Well, David was, Rothenberg, is that who it is? I'm not sure. Maybe? <laughs> but I was thinking about it a lot because it argued that really in our society the most conventionally beautiful people succeed. And so I, I gave a lot of thought to that. And what, what does that even mean anymore? What is conventional beauty now? And, and, and it, is it different across cultures or is it all based on like the Fibonacci sequence and spirals and bone structure that I'll never understand? Right? Mm -hmm. um, so I and how much is it decided by the people in power, right? By the people in power. Yeah. I think beautiful is going to be like what I look like as the person in power, right? And you're all going to have to look like me. <laughs> I wasn't speaking like in the real first person there, <laughs> to be clear. <laughs> but no, but that's but that's a, a really serious question, right? Like, so I have this poem called Medium Beige, which is the mm -hmm. color of foundation that I wear. Mm -hmm. Just in case you're wondering where that. We will talk about my mother and her tights, her, her pantyhose, in fact. <laughs> Which is such a, but it also, um, beauty has something to do with the law of averages. Uh, I think that book explained, right? Like there's something comforting about beauty because there is a very, like an averageness to it. Like there's nothing that's serious. Unchallenging. <laughs> no asymmetry, it's unchallenging, mm -hmm. very simple. Um, and I thought, well, what could be simpler than my medium beige? Hmm. But it's actually more olive, but I mean, it's not even olive. <laughs> <laughs> so, medium beige. On the built in speckled vanity lie implements of tedium, a flat iron, tacky with the residue of product from this morning, tourmaline plates waiting in their wire heap to pull my matted waves into respectability. I, I obviously didn't do that today. <laughs> with a little help from argan oil, which is only lately de rigueur, and other various pomades and fixatifs. I remember paying $30 once to have my hair glossed. I was in first year, a wreck in Halifax, but I had the shiniest hair on Roby Street. I always held it up to the sun, then let it fall, a slow flip. All the way home on the train that year, I let the play of gold and violet pigments occupy me thankful for the light that came in at the window. My shade now derives in part from lavender, though it is nearly black. Sometimes the dye is not available, ingredients still growing. Everything organic, sulfate free. Loose mineral powder, stiff kabuki brush, and subtle blush and coffee rose fit nicely in a Tupperware container in the vanity's top drawer. The bluish plastic bothers me, of course, but nothing else has worked. The hemp and sizzle bags and the woven baskets, all leached powder and pencil shavings, smirching the white laminate. Nestled there as well is my gold-plated eyelash curler, like the handwork jaw of a baby croc, freckled with mascara. This device I used to think was glamorous. Babysitters had them. <laughs> Liz and Amy used them. Ooh. <laughs> Far as I can tell, it makes no difference. My eyes appear to be no more open. I've gleaned what I could from magazines, but no one ever really showed me how to part and elongate my lashes. Not even when we used to make each other up, lining each other's lids, our breath on each other's faces. One night, Lizzie gave me one eye whore, one innocent. 
I was trying not to study her too much as she applied the coal and silver, so I missed the art of what she'd done. It's too late now. Most acquire the knack in young adulthood or abandon the pursuit. I am afraid to. Next to the sink, a soapstone Aphrodite, dusted with a film of luminizing bronzer, oversees the plucking, remnant of a time when I believed that there was something sacred in the daily undertaking. I know it now to be mundane. The goddess I gaze on is factory made. We will not be starting any wars. Prettiness relies upon an aggregate, an average, and the prettiest are clung to. So I spend the hour it takes to generate a face, completely unobjectionable, warm, medium, beige. Mm. <laughs> so what I wanted to share with you, and I suppose everybody, about my poor mother's pantyhose, <laughs> is that when we would go to the grocery store together, she would buy her pantyhose, and she would always put the medium beige into the into the grocery cart with like a big sigh and go like, oh, medium beige. <laughs> so it's so interesting that what you're saying about the, you know, the, uh, the beautiful is apparently the average and so is like lauded as beautiful, but it's also, uh, the average is also kind of got this sort of depressing side. Very to humdrum. It. It's the beige, right? It's, it's yeah. very, very humdrum. Yeah, unchallenging, unexciting. Yeah. yeah. The new shade I wear is called Ginger. Which is a little bit more, you know, exciting. <laughs> I think a little more zingy. It's still medium beige. <laughs> all medium beige. But that seems like, I mean, it feels partly to me like a brave poem, and then it's like this peek behind the scenes, like into creating the facade that is supposed to be presented to the world. Um, and it feels kind of brave to expose all that and all the the effort, the labor that goes into being a certain kind of beautiful. Yes. Yeah, not that I think that I ever necessarily achieved it, but I definitely spent the money, you know, uh, to try to buy all the products that I needed to, like, you know, get presented. And the hours, right? The labor of that is, is striking to me. Well, the truth of the matter is, though, I've never spent more than 10 minutes, like, really fussing with myself, but probably there's more, like, time spent reading how you actually put eyeliner on, and, oh, my God, when I was 13, I got sent to etiquette school. And we were, we, taught, we were taught how to like properly line our eyelashes and properly paint our nails. And I still remember some of that. Wow. Yeah. And I liked how you, in the poem, I think you say something about there's a ritual to it that um, you sort of were excited about at one point and then realized like, no, this is just me doing my routine stuff. Like it's not. Yeah, this is, this is like daily hygiene. Well, I always used to love to try new products and shampoos, and if it had like a, an exotic flower essence or something like that, right, that used to get me excited. And then as I got older, I realized like that's all, that's all coming from factories. It's not like coming from a magical garden on the hillside. Right. <laughs> I mean, the whole process, like the, the money and the labor, to me it feels like a bit of a trap, like a trap for women. Yeah. Um, but I wonder, like, I don't know, when you said like, I had the shiniest hair in Roby Street. I oh. wonder if there's also like a, like a, you know, like all the negative feelings I associate with this. Like, is there is there also something? Well, let's talk about beauty. Satisfying in it. I think so because let's talk about beauty, right? I realized just now when I was reading this again that there's this whole passage in it where I talk about how I used to watch my babysitters do it and my my Liz and Amy well. Liz and Amy, I really did have a girlfriend named Liz, but I never had one named Amy, but I was actually thinking of Elizabeth Bishop and Amy Lowell, and I was thinking about, <laughs> I was thinking about how women teach women uh, and how we can learn from that, that long line of women that came before us. Okay, my mom never taught me how to put makeup on, and I never actually was one of those girls that would watch her put makeup on, but I know some little girls watch their mother's routines, and I paid close attention to my friend's routines, and I had a friend who was an artist, Elizabeth, and I would pay such close attention with how she put makeup on because she was able to create shadows and give you bone structure that you did not have. Right. And I thought that that was really interesting. And I think that at some point in here, towards the end of the poem, I was like conflating the act of what we do with our poems uh -huh. because we take our, our raw, messy thoughts and we shape them into, you know, we craft them into something that flows that is more maybe beautiful or, you know, depending on how you want to define beautiful, something that's more highly crafted. Mm -hmm. And I don't know that there's a, a big difference, right? We craft our, our personas and our appearances. And is that necessarily making them inauthentic or is it just, you know, putting your best foot forward? 
I mean, yeah, I think there's, there's a fine line. There's a strange uh, impulse, I think, to like um, to sort of prize like a natural beauty and to look down on like my dyed hair. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? And yet, with the poem, we prize that like that crafting and that uh, that shaping. Right. So it's the mental acuity we prize that, but I think that when it comes to like fem feminine or you know primping or makeup or not necessarily feminine, but anybody who, who's putting that kind of an effort into their appearance of any gender, uh, we are tempted right away to look down on it. But right. it's another form of expression, and it doesn't necessarily all have to do with vanity, per se, as it might to do just with self-expression. That seems key to me, like the feeling that you have to do it versus the feeling that you want to do it because it says something about who you are and how you are in the world. Right, exactly. Yeah. And it can get, I think it can become easy to uh, never figure that out for yourself because we're confronted with these standardized images of what's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Well, very interesting connection, I think, between the like the putting on of the makeup and whatnot and the, the creation of a poem. <laughs> That's not something I've thought of before. So I appreciate that. Oh, thanks. Yeah, no, I actually had forgotten that I had, had worked that in there. Yeah. Can I ask how you're doing with your writing life sort of post- Virga and through the pandemic, like what, and in fact, your reading life, like what's, how is this whole thing that we're experiencing together, six feet apart here, yeah. <laughs> how's that affecting your writing and reading life or is it? Uh, oh, it's having an effect for sure. I've actually um, been working on a, a book that's more nonfiction than, than poetry, so it's my first time trying to write something cohesive in prose and that's been really challenging but I think that because of more time at home less hours out doing activities and commuting it's actually maybe going a little quicker than right. I had anticipated <laughs> more writing time <laughs> more writing time sort of like I have kids so I actually don't have any time ever but right <laughs> but, it's, but there is that like extra there's that little bit of extra time and so I'm working on that. But as far as reading goes, I've been reading so much poetry because I think that it provides a break between like the fire hose of information that's been coming at us all year. Right. I haven't been able to like focus on novels or longer or longer bits of writing, essays that are particularly long. I can't seem to do it. But poetry seems to be the right length, like for me to transition between these like daily updates that are like constant. <laughs> Can you say something about what's different, like what poetry offers you versus the daily updates? Oh my goodness. Well, with the daily updates, it's just like this quick processing, right? Like you have to like, okay, here's where we are now. Here's what's different. Here's where it's changed. Yeah. Uh, now there's a new rule. Now we have to wear our masks uh, everywhere we go. Or now the kids need to wear their masks at school all day. And what's that going to mean? Which mask am I going to send? Like it's yep. like a constant, you know, like needing to get up to speed. Yeah. Where with poetry... Um, um, that provides an opportunity to maybe think beyond uh, the the daily necessities and the daily struggles to with a, like a more I don't know Thoreau used to call it reading the eternities but like yeah. and some of the stuff for poetry that I read has nothing to do with the eternities and it's very present time but it still it helps you kind of step out of that of that kind of panicky constant need to to reassess where we're at and, and drift a little and, and think and process. It was interesting even just hearing you talk about it, like you very much mimicked a stream of information coming at you and then you like took this like breath and said, and then poetry. <laughs> <laughs> and I felt like you almost answered it right there. Like I will go, I will go lie down. I'll, I'll tell my kids like mommy's go and meditate for half an hour. And that might be the only time I get in the day and I might not always meditate. I might just read three or four poems. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, I've been working through a few collections, mm -hmm. yeah, as I go. But I find that it's like the perfect, it's the perfect kind of transitional art form, like almost like a piece of music, yeah. to kind of get me from one whatever it is to the next whatever it is. But in between, it's that piece or that that I like, place I can go. I feel like I always experience that with poetry, but yeah. the the contrast feels more pronounced now, and the urgent need for that space feels absolutely. More as well. I agree with you, yeah, absolutely. 
I would love to talk to you more. I have more questions, but I think we should probably wrap it up now. <laughs> but thank you very much for coming in and reading some poems and talking with me about some of them as well. Yes, great. thank you so much for having me, and thank you to the Sussex Art Center and Jane and for your thoughtful questions. And I bet you we'll get to talk more one of these days uh, when we can be together in the world again. Sounds good. Thank you so much. I'm so glad you read those Dorothy poems. <laughs> yeah, that delighted me.